Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. Our goal in this segment is to take the first steps toward mastery of the chemistry of lipids. So let's put lipids into the, this larger biological context in which we've been operating. So remember that organisms, um, cheetahs or uh, mushrooms or bacteria are vehicles built by design information behaving as if their goal is to replicate that design information and in the course of doing that they make a whole set of sophisticated molecular tools including lo uh, complex catalysts that are encoded by genetic design information. We've been spending a lot of time in the last several segments looking at the properties of those catalysts. We're now going to turn attention to some of the things those catalysts build, and in particular, macromolecular things those catalysts build. We're ultimately, in the next two segments, going to culminate with these large structures that uh, define the boundaries of cells, membranes, and so on. They are made of lipids. Our goal today is to understand a, the specific components of those lipids that are built by Macro, genetically encoded macromolecular machines. So let's be clear. We have genetically encoded protein macromolecular sh machines that then go on to build other macromolecular machines, some of which are built of lipids. And it's lipids that we're going to be focused on today. So let's focus on I the, the sort of um, nomenclature and uh, phylogeny, if you will, of lipid molecules. That'll be our focus in this segment. So we understand who the players who are, are the, who the actors are. At first glance, the phylogeny of lipid components of larger structures like membranes can be a little bewildering. There are several different kinds. Uh, it's their, their structures at first glance look rather wildly different. As you'll see over the next few minutes, they're not. That is, the lipids that build membranes uh, share a s whole set of very uniform and specific and predictable properties. In fact, they're quite similar in their structures in almost all cases. And that will be our emphasis for the next couple of minutes, is understanding what those lipids are, how they're built, and why, even though they look a little different superficially, they have same, the same underlying fundamental structure. And that fundamental structure, in turn, will let us in the next segment understand how basic thermodynamics, the energetics of biological organisms, allows these lipid subunits that we're going to look at in the next few minutes to be built into large structures like membranes, for example. So one of the key small subunits of lip biological lipids are fatty acids, and four of them are diagrammed here. They are all carbolic carboxylic acids. These are shown, of course, in the sort of chemical convention uh, of showing all the groups as neutral, but at neutral pH in a biological system, the uh, acidic groups would be ionized. These would have pKa's in the ranges of, of two or three, for example, like the, the carboxyl groups on amino acids. These are acidic molecules. However, in lipids, the acidic component is almost always involved in a bond with another molecule, as we'll see in the next couple of minutes, so that the charges in lipids mostly don't come from the fatty acyl group. Let's look at a couple of other, the acyl group on the fatty acids, that is. Let's look at a couple of other things. The uh, leftmost molecule here is what's called a saturated fatty acid. And if you pause the tape and take a moment to look down it, you'll notice that it's a long chain alkene with no double bonds. In other words, all, every carbon forms f uh, four separate bonds, either with carbon or with hydrogen. There are no, uh, every double bond is saturated in the jargon of, uh, of uh, or is reduced, saturated in the jargon of lipid chemistry. The three at the right are unsaturated, and the two rightmost are polyunsaturated. And what's meant by that terminology is that if you're unsaturated but not polyunsaturated, you have one double bond. And if you're polyunsaturated, you have two or more, as the two rightmost polyunsaturated fatty acids do. This turns out to be really important to their behavior in ways that we'll see in just a moment. And by controlling the fatty acid composition of lipids, how many are saturated, how many are unsaturated, uh, biological organisms are able to shape the behavior of their membranes rather, uh, uh, in, in rather sophisticated ways. So therefore, even though membranes are not directly encoded by genetic design information, the tools built by design information can in turn design those uh, uh, lipid membranes to have s desirable properties, different properties in different cases, as we'll see in the next segment after this one. All right. So let's look at uh, the implications of this saturation for uh, the behavior of fatty acids uh, with regard to their melting temperature, as symbolized on the right-hand side of this column. So let's, let's zero in on this table and just take a moment to look at what it's telling us. So you'll notice that the uh, uh, Fatty acids in the top half of the table are all saturated, and the ones in the bottom half of the table are all monounsaturated. 
So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very convenient comparison. Look at the melting points. For the saturated fatty acids, even the shortest one with 12 carbons is, has a melting point above human body temperature, 42 degrees centigrade. Human body temperature, recall, is 37 degrees centigrade. And as these fatty acids get longer, their melting temperature gets higher and higher and higher. So these are solid, these would be solid fats at body temperature. In contrast, if you look at the bottom half of the monounsaturated fatty acids, uh, these monounsaturated fatty acids have much lower melting temperatures. Uh, all of them, with the possible exception of the uh, longest one at 24, are well below human body temperature. So in some cases, I, I'm sorry, in some cases they are polyunsaturated. You'll notice and the polyunsaturated ones have even lower melting temperatures. So let's now look at why that's why that is the case. Let's take a simple e example. This is oleic acid, a common uh, fatty acid in animals. And let's compare the trans configuration here, which is what is not built by biological organisms. So we haven't said so yet, but the double bonds in fatty acids uh, of biological lipids are almost always not trans, they are cis. So let's look at the trans non-biological configuration first. When the fatty acids side chain comes into a double bond on one side and then comes out on the opposite side. It has the effect of preserving the linear structure of that alkane side chain. On the other hand, in the cis configuration, when, you, when the uh, alkane chain comes in one side of the double bond upstream and leaves on the same side downstream, the cis configuration has the effect of kinking the uh, side chain. That's a huge difference. The Linear side chains can pack together quite tightly with forming strong van der Waals interactions and uh, various kinds of hydrophobic interactions that we've talked about so previously, and they tend to be high melting. The using the use of cis uh, uh, fatty acids in biological membranes, these kinked fatty acids, uh, uh, those fatty acids don't pack together as efficiently and they melt at much lower temperatures. So as you might imagine, biological organisms are going to control the relative amounts of uh, both saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, and because the unsaturated fatty acids are cis, by adding unsaturated fatty acids to the membrane lipids, you're going to reduce its melting temperature. You're going to control its fluidity, how, how much it's like an oil and how much it's like a solid fat. Uh, uh, again, a subject we'll come to in the next topic in more detail. All right, so let's now start looking at how these um, fatty acids get combined with other components to make the, the actual larger subunits that make up biological membranes and, and lipid-based biological structures. We'll call these composite lipids because we're putting together fatty acids and other components to build the actual unit that's going to be assembled into a membrane or whatever else it might be. A very large class of these composite lipids are built around the three carbon glycerol skeleton shown here. Remember glycerol uh, has three hydroxyl groups. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alcohol with three uh, groups on it. And when fatty acids are bound to all three of those groups in ester linkages, you have what's called a triacylglycerol. Now, what I want you to notice here are two things. If you look at the fatty acid, let's go back to that image. If you look at the fatty acids bound here, they're bound in ester linkage to the hydroxyl uh, groups of glycerol. And as a result, there is no charge, right? The, 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 fatty, the fatty acid acyl group is not ionized now, it's bonded in a neutral ester linkage. So when you make a large triacylglycerol in this way, you're making a neutral lipid. So neutral lipids are in fact very hydrophobic. Even with their occasional double bonds and the other things that we just talked about a moment ago, they are not, they are not hydrophilic when the carboxylic acid groups and fatty acids are in these neutral uh, ester linkages. Therefore, these are extraordinarily hydrophobic molecules. This class of triacylglycerols are encountered mostly in the large fat droplets in adipocytes, the, uh, the cells that specialize in storing fat. The fat in your body is stored mostly in adipocytes in these very large droplets made up of these neutral lipids, triglycerides. So those will turn out to be very important to the energy metabolism of the cells. So the fatty acid can be broken out of these triacylglycerols, released into the uh, circulatory system, and they can be taken up by your individual cells and burned as food, something we'll talk about later in more detail. <coughs> But uh, we're less concerned in this segment and the next one about these metabolic storage neutral lipids. We're more concerned with amphiphilic lipids. And so almost...